good morning. So this is our last class for IO, and I'm gonna revisit the topic of values, health, workplace wellness, health, illness, linked to your value systems. I'm going to revisit the archetypes and I'm going to tie it into that famous show, The Office, because they do a really good job of showing the archetypes. And then I'll sort of kind of wrap up with sort of goals for our field in the counseling field. There can be extrapolated to any work that you go into, but specifically what we would do as counselors, either in an IO setting or of course, just private practice. So those are the themes for today. Remember that this entire month was about sacred space, work as sacred space, sort of being the commoner, divine and, and human, original and ordinary um, workplace wellness, illness, how we spend so much time at work and what the function of work is from a soul perspective, which is to kind of integrate all these different archetypes, these aspects of self and to, um, to sort of bend and, and learn and, and achieve wisdom and skill all in this sort of 30 year Saturn archetype period. So there's two universal laws we're gonna talk about today. One is the principle of mentalism and it's going to be related to energy. And again, this is the all is mine. This is that universal cookie dough that we're all a part of, that we all come from. Everything is energy, how we spend our energy. And in the earthly world, it's time, money, resources is going to be linked to how we get sick or if we stay healthy. And this is linked to our value system where we spend our time, energy, resources is directly linked to our values. So a lot of my clients struggle with naming their value system. And I just ask to see their calendar or where they spend their time, their energy and their resources and what they judge. And we'll talk about that again. We're also gonna talk about the law of polarity. And you guys know my theory of the zero to 100 that comes from this law. And we're gonna talk about the 48 to 52. Health is found in the 48 to 52 the intersection of your own personal values and corporate values at work are the 48 to 52. So this is very important for this particular class. So a few myths we're gonna talk about. Nereo, she's the personification of valor. And we're gonna talk about sort of the, the word val or the, the, that prefix. Arit was the goddess of valor and virtue. And we're gonna talk about virtues today linked to health as well as impure thoughts or vices as well. Virtus was the Roman God of bravery. And we're gonna to link to living our value system as an act of bravery. And what most people can't define their values is because if they show up for themselves then what do they lose? Seems a little ironic that we are afraid to be ourselves, show up for ourselves, have a value system, um, have valor and be healthy, but it's actually something that we're not allowed to do. We don't have that in our template, in our programming. Asclepius, which is considered the God of medicine was given the name because it means to cut open. And I spend a lot of time cutting people open, so to speak, sort of what are you made of? What are your values? What are your thoughts? Those deep, dark shadow aspects. Because when we cut someone open, not literally, obviously, we can see sort of what their thoughts, emotions, desires are and what they're valuing. And so that's part of why we have to have hard edges. It's part of why we have to remove masks and be very strong with our clients and not just coddle them because we need to literally cut them open or figuratively cut them open so we can see what they're made of and why their life is the way it is. In the Egyptian mythology, there was something called the Hall of Mat when you died and Mat was the uh, goddess of like justice. And Anubis would take your heart, put it on a scale next to Mat's feather 
And it said that if your heart was lighter than a feather, you would go to the, the next life. And if your heart was heavier than Matt's feather, then you would go to the underworld. So think of the importance of having the lightness of heart, virtue, bravery, living by your value systems. And this is all very personal. I'll share some, you know, sort of archetypes and, and um, lists of virtues, but ultimately this is a very, very, very personal thing. And this is the crux of our mental health, our physical health and our spiritual health. And we'll talk about the definition of health today. So what does your heart want to be weighed against, against what sort of template? And that's how you live your life. And part of our job is to help clients figure this out. And then we're gonna wrap up talking about Apollo, that's the sun god. And we're gonna talk about the sun archetype, which is part of that narcissism and that divine and how it shows up in our life so that we can make ourselves whole. So the word valer actually means to be in good health in Latin. And the word value or values comes from this, valer. And I highlighted here, creator of value, establisher of vital norms. This is a very personal process. We are given our value system at the moment of conception. And most of us are struggling with the entirety of that value system. And I've said this to you multiple times. We don't veer from that value system of mom and dad very much, but we do have to make it our own. We have to take those values that are linked to judgments that we'll talk about and make them our own. How are we going to internalize that value system and make it something that's palatable to us that makes us have courage to live a good life, a virtuous life, something that keeps us healthy rather than self-betrayal. Mental health, physical health issues are directly linked to your value system, not having one or living one that's in self-betrayal of what your beliefs are because you haven't broken them down or cut them open to see what they're about. So this is extremely important, our health, so when we talk about workplace wellness or illness or illness as a role or as a function and illness mentality, it's directly related to values. And I cannot tell you how difficult it is for people to define their values. List them sometimes is really hard, but defining them in measurable terms, it's practically impossible. And I'll explain a little bit more why. The word valor is strength of mind or spirit your mental health, your spiritual health, and of course directly related, your physical health is extremely linked to your values. Do you have valor to live your values? This is personal bravery. Nobody can tell you how to live your life, what your values are, but yourself. And valer in Spanish means to be worth, to be of worth, to have worth. Where you put your money, your time and your resources, which are the currency of the material world, speaks to what you find to be worthy. So you can be saying that you are not lazy and if you're spending all your time scrolling on social media and not being productive, so to speak, and again, these are very personal definitions, then you're not valuing, let's say, hard work or productivity. So it's part of our analysis of self and with clients is to see where they spend time. And you can see this, and I talked about this last week, with that time management grid. Where are you spending time? Are there distractions? Are you spending it on unimportant tasks? Are you only responding to urgency? That's going to tell you a lot of what people um, value and where they spend their resources. So why is it so hard for us to have a clear personal value system? Why is it so hard to define these values? And it's directly linked to our basic, basic unmet needs. I've told you that there are four unmet needs. The first is safety and security. Nobody, this is linked to part of the coercion I spoke to you about last week, nobody had a safe childhood. 
You didn't know what was going to set your parents off. You didn't know if you were going to get in trouble for bringing home a B instead of an A. You didn't know exactly what to expect. And it was not directly related to you. You might have been given, you know, you need to get straight A's. You need to take out the trash on Tuesdays. You might have given that sort of safety. But the problem is, and this is sort of where the narcissism comes in, is that if your mom or dad were having a bad day, and they were set off, they got into a car accident, they got fired, or something didn't go right for them, they would take it out on you because your job is to meet their needs. And all of a sudden you internalize, life is not safe or secure, I must make it safe and secure for my parents, then I will be of worth then I will be of value. This is directly related to why we will not have bravery, bravery or courage or valor to assume our own needs and our own value system. So I ask clients, what happens? What do you lose when you make yourself safe? When you make a safe world for yourself? What do you lose if you become healthy financially, spiritually, mentally, sexually, spiritually healthy. There's a cost. And what do you lose if you actually stand up for your values and define your values? What is it that you lose? You might lose your entire identity. I've said before, most of us will lose this conditional version of love, the Costco card membership to our family, because that's the way the family works based on these secret motives or judgments or values that no one talks about these moquitas. So asking yourself or asking your client, what do you give up? What do you lose when you actually take charge of life, when you become safe and secure? It's very scary. So I had a very emotional weekend, cried a lot for a couple of days. And I was sort of doing like this life review. And I was really confronted with, this fact and how unsafe my childhood was. On one end, my childhood was beautiful. I had very loving parents for what a, a innocent snow globe is. And I very much have an innocent archetype that I've worked through, but I never had consistency. I never, I never had continuity. What time I had to be home, who I could go out with, what I would get in trouble for, what I had to, to show up as. And this creates a very, very uncertain life. And what did I do? What did I do with that? What did I become as a result? And that's gonna be sort of my wrap up take home message is I created these rule books. I literally in the seven gates say, you have to create a rule book. And we'll talk about that. You need a philosophy of life in every area of your life. We are not taught to have permission to do this. And so what I did for a living was I started writing theory. I started writing rule books and workbooks and handouts and questions in 48 to 52 and zero to 100, all of these parameters to make my life safe. And it just brought up a lot of emotion, how much lack of safety and security there was, despite a loving home, just not having structure, not having that rules, not having open dialogue. Um, those things make us very unsafe. And so we don't want to lose. And if you had a very unhealthy childhood and a very unsafe in terms of violence, you might be more likely to do this sort of interrogation. But if your family seemed, like I've said, those snow globes with small cracks or normal cracks, you may not go into deep self-analysis of this because it's like, well, it wasn't that bad. I can justify and, and make excuses. So I had a client this past weekend and she's in her early 20s mid to early 20s and we were talking about this and she's like you know sometimes people hear me talk to my mother and they say oh you're so mean to her and it's something that we we struggle with during different ages of our life is how we speak to our parents and she's actually at a very appropriate age to, to kind of push mom back and, and set a boundary because mom is so invasive. And then later on, we might learn techniques. We learn how to sort of get out of the energy so that we're not so enmeshed. And that comes with obviously therapy and skill and, and time and wisdom. But it's not 
unusual for people that don't have safety or have very enmeshed or coercive homes that they, they pull away or they want to not be with their family or talk to their parents. And you see this quite a bit in therapy. Um, and it's not wrong or right. And, and, and you could choose to sort of separate from your parents however you wish, but it's all about in your head. It's about creating these boundaries and structures and pillars in your head, not necessarily externally, although sometimes the external environment needs a very strict boundary to keep you know, par parents at bay, especially if it, was, if it was not safe. So asking what you lose, it seems sort of like an oxymoron that we would lose something by standing up for ourselves, that we would lose something if we create safety, if we become healthy, but we do. We lose our story, we lose our identity, we might lose very key players in our life that are feeding into our unmet needs if we start meeting them for ourselves. So we can't go into a client session or a client life or our own thinking that everybody wants health, that everyone wants balance. It's not true. We're very attached to the story and it's serving us. And that's why we oftentimes don't define values. If you do not know your values, you will self-betray and get sick. You may not get physically sick unless your body can no longer carry the, the weight of your thoughts, but you will get mentally sick. You will burn out or get stressed, as we've talked about all month in terms of illness in the workplace. And it's linked to self-betrayal. It's linked to not knowing who you are. It's linked to not knowing your value systems. So again, asking yourself and your clients, what are your top two values and it can't be family? How do your corporate values match up with your personal values? I showed you my leadership wheel and how these things match up, but this is important. Are you working in a place that directly conflicts or violates your value system? Last week, we talked about fear-based cultures and trust-based cultures. Are you in a fear-based culture because you can't um, confront things from childhood and you're just still in the story creating the fight or flight and being sick or being the victim is still serving you. And today we're gonna to talk about your personal definition of health. It's gonna be linked directly to work and money, but does the thread that you share with your job, with the corporation that you work for, does it make you sick or does it add to health in your life in whichever way you define that? So there's a few definitions of health. There's, there's several, but I bring three. So I'll start here. This is the World Health Organization. And they say that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Some people would say that illness is just the absence, or health is just the absence of illness. It's a little simplified. So here they're talking about physical health, mental, and social health as being a whole and complete person. This food for thought pyramid has to do with play, has to do with relationships, has to do with prayer, with emotions, with resilience, with exercise, so the physical and nutritional component. So is health for you only physical? Is it spiritual? Is it emotional? Here's a socioeconomic, is it financial? So you get to decide the pillars that you define as health. I've shared this definition of Ayurveda before, but it specifically talks about being established in self with a capital else. This is the individuation process. This is absolutely knowing your values, your worth, your identity, your purpose. Doshas and Agni has to do with your third chakra, your fire, your, of course, your digestion. Um, these are very physical waste tissues, et cetera. But here is clarity, bliss, soul, senses in mind. Are your senses used properly? Are they having positive, healthy things like what I shared, the muses with you come in? How is your mind of balance? And today we'll talk about the archetypes. So what pillars of health make up your definition of health? This is again, very personal. They're linked to your values. They're linked to your rule book and philosophy of life. You cannot have a rule book for life. You cannot have a definition of health or philosophy of life if you don't know what pillars construct health in your mind. 
Maybe for you, it's all about financial health and ambition. That's okay, it's personal, but then you've got to get very clear on what those are. So here I have financial, sexual, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, and social. In the seven gates, I tell readers or I recommend to readers to break it up because for me, it's like the 12, the 12 archetypes, the 12 wheel, you know, uh, aspects of astrology and break it up in to the 12 aspects of the astrology chart, but they can collapse into these seven, or you can have just maybe two or three, like the World Health Organization, physical, mental, and social, or financial and sexual, whatever areas are important to you. They're going to be directly linked to your values and your judgments, which we'll talk about. So your values, your health, and your pillars are um, directly related. Your pillars of health are defined by you. So I say get a notebook and divide your pillars of health that are linked to your value system and write your rules around that area of life. Sometimes people think that mental health or spiritual health is such this big communion with the divine and getting spiritual messages or never having you know, a, a bad thought. And we, we've learned repeatedly that that's not it. The impure thought is immediate. It's going to come in. You're going to have the judgment. I was watching this Brene Brown interview the other day, and she's like, the shame never goes away. The shame in her language is the impure thought in my language. The moment you judge, the moment you're having a conversation, if I know more, you're ugly. I don't like you. I don't want to be here. Whatever that impure thought is directly linked to what you value. So it's not about putting these away, but rather identifying that recognizing these aspects of yourself will lead to mental health, physical health, spiritual health. So when I was going through cancer the first time, I realized I didn't have a philosophy of food because my mom didn't cook. Um, I really had not played... I had a degree in nutrition for that reason, because I wanted to figure out my health issues, having had an eating disorder for so long, but I really had never decided what my philosophy of food was. And so I started trying on different things. I tried vegan and I tried FODMAPs and I tried all these different things. And then I finally established what is a true philosophy of food for me. Now I told you the other day, I was figuring out what my tipping strategy is, how I'm going to use my money when I decide to eat out. Because COVID brought that service industry to the forefront, it became something that I want to have a value system around. So that is spiritual work. That is mental health. It doesn't matter if it's linked to your definition of physical in terms of diet or financial in terms of tipping or how you're going to budget. Those are all pillars of health. And you get to determine what things are going to fall under each. I used to be an extremely sentimental person, and that was destroying me. It was destroying my relationships, my life. I could not continue to be so sentimental. I really had to get a handle on my emotional health and what that was going to be like. So when we start going down to the specifics of our pillars of health, then we get a very clear you know, sort of feeling around what we feel. And I think I shared this with you the other day. I went out and trying out my new tipping sort of strategy. And I went out to lunch with the people from work. And the iPad thing only had certain percentages. And I didn't feel the service was that great. I wanted to leave 15% and it wasn't available. And the guy next to me was like, oh, just press that. And I said, no, I'm, I'm trying out my, my tipping so I can see how I feel. That's valor, that's courage, that's values, that's standing up for yourself, speaking up for what you're doing. That's a spiritual STD, saying, thinking, and doing. I'm going to figure it out. When I do Uber Eats, when I pick up, I'm feeling my way to see what feels right. One of the things I learned is that I don't want to leave less than 15%. That doesn't feel right, even if it's bad service. Nobody can tell me otherwise. It's what I feel is right with me, what's my truth. That's spiritual work. That's mental health. That's living your value systems. This is very, very personal. And it's your definition of health. So I really recommend having sort of clear sections or pillars or, or sections in your notebook so that you can start putting 
and figuring out. This is also that zero to 100 in the 48 to 52. If zero is too little and 100 is too much, what feels right? And this doesn't come overnight. You try this out for size. Anytime something shows up in my sphere of consciousness that I've invited in, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm gonna work on now. That's how this happened with the tipping. It wasn't something that was on my forefront and it started showing up quite a bit. And so anything that comes up in your life over and over that you've invited in is showing up to heal, is showing up for you to get a value system around it, a definition around it. So those are spiritual activities. Those are mental health activities that you'll work with your clients. So your judgments are confessions and they're great. Your judgments are linked to values. What do you judge? If someone shows up and you don't like what they're looking, perhaps you're very prideful or very vain. That could be the impure thought that links to your value system around image. And that's absolutely okay. Or pride that you have ambition and that you want to get somewhere. Yesterday I was editing the spiritual adulting book and the editor had written a comment about anger and he was like questioning the generality of it anger is one of those things we all have it is an archetype so addressing how we're going to get angry rightful indignation like aristotle calls it there's a space for anger or wrath there's a space for sloth you might say you're such a hard worker you never take a day off and then you get sick as a result and that's the way you balance that so it really is linked to your judgments or linked to your value system. And part of the job of discovering that law of polarity, that 48 to 52, that golden mean, is to find out what you feel is comfortable. That's where your emotions, where your body checking in, like I'm doing now with the tipping, comes into play. And do these judgments, do these values link up with your definition of health? Are you saying, that pride isn't something or gluttony isn't something that you have and your living may be very scarce or very limited financially or food wise and you're getting sick as a result because you're trying to you're being out of balance you're living out of balance and are you sick because you cannot tolerate a value system that you have are the impure thoughts around a certain section of your life being so prideful being so gluttonous making you sick I have a client who's extremely gluttonous. She lives very scarce. Her diet is extremely, extremely limited. Her financial management is extremely limiting because she's trying to not own that she's gluttonous and she's getting sick. She's got a disease. I told you that there are scarcity diseases where her body is actually crumbling. So when you hear those words, they'll tell you what they're linked to because obviously, um, the zero to 100 of, and I'm just using here the cardinal sins. Um, you can use whatever language you want when you're identifying the impurity of your thought. So the zero has the 100 and you can identify those. So these are just some that I've paired up. It doesn't mean that it has to be yours, but this is sort of how I look at it. So do your values, do your judgments, does your definition of health, do your vices or impure thoughts match up? So here I have envy. Envy is very much linked to emotions. It's to do with melancholy, depression. Um, there's a link psychologically to envy. We talked a little bit last week about the Enneagram when I shared with you the elements and, and the impure thoughts. Lust is not always, but it's oftentimes linked to sexuality or coveting what someone else has. Greed tends to be linked to material, whether it's wealth, financial wealth. I work with a lot of clients on this. And I've told you that the crux of our, our symbolism of the Western world was material wealth, where the Eastern world was more spiritual. And I shared with you that myth of Athena and Poseidon. Pride. Pride has a lot to do with your mental health. Do you think you're better? Do you think you're smarter? Do you think you're so brilliant and nobody recognizes it? Do you play small in terms of your knowledge to not make people feel uh, dumb? Maybe at work, you're listening to your boss and you're like, yeah, I'm smarter than you. I know this already. So that sort of mental connection, it can be from a knowledge place 
communication, and also wisdom. Gluttony, this is, I see this happening a lot with older workers that have younger bosses like the millennials, and they'll struggle with the pride and the mental health because they're like, that kid is a peon and I've been in this field for 30 years. What is he gonna teach me? So that's something I see in practice. Gluttony oftentimes is linked to physical health, eating too much, too little, exercising, um, uh, sort of a gluttonous or, or a hoarding um, tendency. It doesn't only have to be food, but these are sort of how they pair up. Wrath, are you angry? Do you take it out on your relationships, your children, your friends, your family, your coworkers? Um, anger or wrath is definitely something that we have archetypally, and how do we manage that power currency? And sloth is oftentimes linked to spiritual. So as much as we work in terms of ambitious or at work or stay late, what part of our life is getting the sloth? It's oftentimes the spiritual aspect. This is an important thing to explain to clients and for yourself, is that if you're working through your values, even though it may not seem that tipping and my tipping strategy is a spiritual activity, it very much is because it's linked to valor, it's linked to health, it's linked to values, which is linked to the way I show up in the world and the way I spend my time, my money, and my resources. So virtue ethics, this is an approach to ethics that takes the notion that virtue conceived as excellence is fundamental. So I shared with you last week, forget perfection. Perfection is a child's script. Perfection is an insecurity, a feeling of abandonment or low self-worth but rather strive for excellence. And so virtue ethics links virtues to living an excellent life. And an excellent life has to be defined by you and only you. In virtue ex ethics, they say that there are specific character traits that are linked to human flourishing. Remember I talked about eudom eudomania, I can't remember how to pronounce that word, eudamia which is like happiness or contentment or joy. And the goddess Eudamia and workplace wellness is when you're in balance with self, when you're in balance looking at the archetypes or those around you. So you will flourish healthily, if you will, physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, mentally, socially, when you um, live these virtuous traits or have these characters, these characteristics but you are the only one that can determine what those are. Virtue ethics also says that the action has to have an intrinsic value. It is not Kohlberg's conventional morality. I'm going to do this because someone is watching. This is intrinsic. Nobody can tell me how I live. Nobody can tell me how I'm gonna tip and spend my money. Although the guy next door tried. It's about standing up for what you know is right for you. So our parents gave us a template of that, but we have to move away from the way they did it, which does cause health, health issues and self-betrayal if we don't find our own way of doing it. It has to be intrinsic. So the motivation is for self. It's not external or an image or what the outside or society conventions want. And then another branch of ethics is deontology. And this is related more to duty or moral obligation. They believe there are some sort of ethics or um, values that you have to have based on moral obligation or duty to society. But virtue ethics is more about an inward, what you feel is right, what your definitions are, what your self-worth is, the way that you live your truth. So Aristotle, he had different uh, virtues. Um, his top were courage, temperament, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, proper ambition, truthfulness, wittiness, friendliness, modesty, and righteous indignation. These are linked to archetypes. We're going to talk about archetypes in a bit. Here, there's a chart of the 0 to 100 and the 48 to 52 with his, um, his virtues and what he deemed to be sort of the golden mean of the way you behave. So um, you'll see in the, in the archetype 
um, for instance, um, the different ways that people show up. Most of us show up in a low level consciousness. Most of us show up on the extremes. Um, you can be mean, you can be weak, um, you can be extremely arrogant. These are linked obviously to those pillars of health, let's say pride of your arrogance. We're gonna talk about that with the archetype of the sun. Um, abandonment is the archetype of Chiron. Vulgarity is the archetype of Black Moon Lilith. And I'm gonna tie it into that sitcom, The Office, so you can kind of see the low vibration of it. But with all those archetypes, there's a high vibration too. And living in the midpoint is the goal. That's the eudaimia, that's the wellness. That's the pillar of health and having valor and living for your values. Aristotle said a life of happiness is a life of excellent functioning. Again, it's about excellence defined by you, not an other intrinsically, and it's not related to perfection. 48 to 52 is the midpoint. Some might even say mediocre, but it's for you what's balanced and what's a contentment. A life of virtue is a life which the rational faculties are in control. This goes back to emotional health. If your emotions are out of whack, if you're in these swings of zero to 100, you're not equanimous, you're not in a state of balance, you can't think rationally to make a choice. So when I talk about the child, the child questions or that spiritual TED talk, what don't I like about this? What does it prove about me? When we get out of the child of reacting because we wanna get our needs met and our needs met and our needs met, and we actually stop and take the teenager, that pause, that breath, we can then make a choice. We can go right back into child. So the spiritual TED talk doesn't keep you from behaving the old way, but it gives you a pause. It gives you a breath to make a choice rooted in free will. So you're not just sort of determined by your subconscious programming. Then you make a choice to act like an adult, define the need, find your value system and live accordingly, or just go right back into the old you know, paradigm and, and the old script and the old story. And you get to choose that. But when you present your client with these options that they get to actually choose to get out of the story, they get to actually choose to define their values. They get to choose to define the need and meet it for themselves. And they choose to go back into child script to act in the swings of zero to 100, there's no more than just that that's a choice and they don't really get to complain about it any longer. They're just choosing to live in that chaos, that drama, that whirlwind. It's a very different state of mind than when you're just acting because you don't have any knowledge. There's no um, awareness around it. So with Aristotle, when your rational faculties are in control, when you actually stop, take the breath, think, I get to choose, then you're a life of virtue, even if you choose to return back to the story, the drama and the child script. Aristotle says that virtues are destroyed by excess. Again, those zero to 100 swings. It's only when you're living in the 48 to 52 or trying, and I'm gonna show you the, the sun archetype in a moment, that you're trying to get that wiggle room. And the reason I use 48 to 52 is that it's not a precise marker. It's not 50%, that's too exact. Nothing is exact, it's all a range. Sometimes you miss the mark. Sometimes you're a little to the right, a little to the left. That process of figuring, your, figuring out your values, how to show up in every situation is living virtuous. But if you're in those zero to 100 swings like the law of polarity states, then Aristotle says there isn't virtue, you're living in vice, which of course leads to judgments, impure thoughts, not processing them and illness ultimately. So there was a book called CSB, Character, Strengths, and Virtues, that was written by Christopher Peterson and Martin Seligman. I've talked about Martin Seligman the other day. I told you about his PERMA um, acronym. He's also considered the father of positive psychology. So in this book, they talk about character, strengths, and virtues. You can get that. There's a lot of um, lists online. I have a few in my books that are values lists um, so that people have conversation around values. Um, and strengths, again, related to values and the way you show up that valor and that courage. The Stoic said that there were four cardinal virtues. 
um, and I'll talk about the word cardinal in a minute, they were prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Again, balance, equanimity, um, stability, constancy. We see this repeated in what virtues are considered. It's all about the golden mean. It's all about the way, in my language, the 48 to 52. So the word cardinal means hinge. And we call this the cardinal directions. In shamanism, we say the four winds or the cardinal winds. In astrology, they're the cardinal houses, the one, four, seven, ten. These are very marked in our life. The way that we transition those liminal spaces, first, first day of class, I talked to you about liminal spaces. And I talked to you about how work is a sacred space and a liminal space. And spirit and matter meet here. And work is so transitory in the sense that every day, that groundhog day, you're going to figure how to show up. You're going to test the waters. You're going to see, can I push this a little further? Should I pull back? Was I too overly ambitious? Do I have to pull back? Was I reprimanded? How do I self-appraise? It's a constant self-appraisal. So we're constantly on the hinge. We're constantly in the transition, in that liminal space of how much, how little, how, how do I dip my toe or how do I pull back? And that's the word cardinal means hinge or to hinge upon. And so we don't have a precise area. It, it's partly what makes us so feel unsafe or insecure is that we don't have a black and white as to what these are. So the rule books, the philosophy, the definition, the measurable objectives, helps you get much clearer on how you want to show up in your life. And then um, virtue ethics says, be humble, be hospitable, be merciful, be faithful, reconcile, be vigilant, and be reliable. These are more newer definitions of, of ethics, but you can see the themes in terms of midpoint, in terms of not too much, not too little. So I taught you months ago that original sin means missing the mark. And I showed you this sign. This is the glyph of the sun. This is the glyph of the hero archetype that we're going to talk about. And basically, original sin, the fact that we're humans, means we miss the mark. We're never going to have perfection. So we strive for excellence. And excellence is this midpoint, this 48 to 52. What is the midpoint for me? What is virtuous for me? What are values for me? What is health for me? What are my pillars? What are the definitions for me to be safe for my life, in my psyche, in my world, financially, sexually, spiritually, mentally, emotionally? So here again is another sort of Aristotelian type chart, but they use the words deficiency. So it's like a zero and they mark it as vice. And they have vice as excess as well, since Aristotle said that excess kills virtue. And virtue is where you hit the mark. Again, there's no precision. This is very personal to you, but feeling your way through as you do each one, as you sort of define your pillars, as you define everything that shows up, what category it goes into. So courage, determination, friendliness, there's an excess friendliness. The other day I was taking a case study for my book and I asked the couple how they met and what was their first fight. And actually the first fight was that he thought she was too friendly or she was too flirtatious. So that could be excess. Generosity, are you generous? You don't have to save everybody. You don't have to pay for everybody on the street, but are you wasteful? And that could be for your energy, for your time, for your resources. Are you spending too much time, let's say, on social media or wasting away without really working towards goals or your ambitions? Arrogance, shadiness, how much secrecy is, is right, so to speak? Are you transparent? And what is the definition of that? I've worked on this one for a long time because I definitely share too much. So having TMI, and there's a saying, don't give your pearls to swine. You don't have to tell everything to everybody. The person you don't lie to, to is yourself. Here's humorlessness, absurdity, and wittiness. I was working with a client the other day who was commenting on her son, and I can pick up this archetype, and we're going to see it with the Michael Scott archetype of Mercury. Are you a buffoon? Are you doing buffoonery? Are you acting like a fool? 
or are you just witty, you're clever, you're smart, you can kind of, you know, say a joke and, and, and be sort of in the rhythm. So we're in all circumstances, all of these things that show up in our sphere of consciousness can go categorically in one of our pillars of health. And then we can do deeper work and deeper analysis to define and say, oh, I'm gonna show up that way. So the next concept I wanna to talk to you about is a word called Vayera. Vayera actually means, and he appeared. And it's related to the first words in what's called the parasha. So in the Hebrew tradition, they read every week what's called a Torah portion. So the Torah is linked to the Old Testament, um, directly related to the books of Moses. So obviously pre pre Jesus time, and it talks about the first words spoken. And this is a technique I use in with clients all the time, and it proves very very useful. I'm going to link it to the archetypes in a moment. So in every sort of creation myth, there's always the ether. There's always sort of the, the universal consciousness. In the Bible, they say in the beginning was the word, and then it says the word was God. The word has to do with the throat chakra. It has to do with spirit, has to do with ether. It has to do with before the elements, before the air, before the fire, before the water, before the earth. What is the intention? What is the thought before it's materialized into your life? Did you take the fire element and run with it and build a business? Did you just sort of swallow the thought and materialize in the earth as a migraine, as, a, an, as an illness? It all starts with a thought. The thought, whether verbally spoken or thought, will create something. When I start a session, I listen to the first words the client says. So I'll give you an example. I was talking to one of my clients. I said, you know how I knew in our first session that you were an escape artist and you were a glutton? And, um, and there were some other words. I can't remember what she said. Um, and she's like, how, she asked me, she's like, how did you know that? And I said, from the first sentence you spoke. The first sentence she spoke was about the person who referred her and how they met in Beijing. Beijing is out of the United States, so it's a long distance travel. It's linked to Jupiter archetype, which is linked to gluttony, which is linked to excess, which is linked to escapism. And in the, in the funny I'll show you today is linked to Jan, Jan's archetype in the, in the skit of, of the show. And when you start to listen archetypally, you start to pay attention, and I've given you many lectures on symbolic listening and all of the elements for that reason. If you can understand that people speak that archetype at that moment, it doesn't mean that the archetype doesn't change. Most of us have, we have all 12 archetypes you're going to see, and I've shared this with you. But for the most part, we tend to live in one main archetype. That archetype will be our son, that archetype will be our hero, it's the hero's journey. It will be mainly what we say and live in our life shows up as because we've created it from our thoughts. That's why I've tied it into illness. The thoughts that you are, have impure, that you haven't processed, materialize like a brick, like a solid brick into the organ that that thought is related to. So sexual organs may be to lust, gluttony to the hips or to the GI tract. So we've talked about these things. And it's about listening for the first few words. Those first few words are going to link you to the archetype or the issue that the person has to, to work through. This is going to be linked directly to their judgments, to their shadow, and of course, to their value system. So if you listen to clients, those first few words of every session, and you're going to identify a value that keeps coming up. The other day, I was listening to a client and I said, oh, we have to work on the earth element. Therefore, we have to work on boundaries, limitations, uh, the 48 to 52, the earthly body. She's extremely overweight. I refer her to a nutritionist so she can start working on, on her physical you know, um, obesity issues that are earth element. So when you start listening and the conversation all started because she was sharing a, a story about her daughter in cheer camp 
and not wanting to spend the money. So the money, the earth element, there's something here that's linked to the archetype of earth or Saturn in this case. So when we start to listen in this words, we're gonna know the story. That's why when I do that, tell me a story um, activity with you guys, besides listening to the story that you say with those three pictures, I can see the thread. That archetype says, I want to address this. I value this. This is how I want to dictate the session. And we have to start listening archetypally. So this brings me again to this glyph of the sun. So the sun is Apollo in mythology. In astrology, it's the center of our chart. The solar system is the sun. The sun is the god Ra. In, in any of these cultures, the sun is obviously the god. Um, actually, when um, you say the son of man or the son of God, it's not S-U-N, it's not S-O-N, sun, like Jesus was the sun, but S-U-N, the sun in the sky, the center. So there's idea that we're the center of our life, we're the center of our solar system, we're the center of our universe. That's why I always say dethrone your parents, put yourself on the kingdom. This is you on your kingdom. And I've shown you the archetype before of the sixth chakra that has a pedal to the right that is the father and a pedal to the left that is the mother. So the parents are always there. They're always in our headspace. They're always sort of indicating the boundaries and the limitations of our value system, of our definition of health, of how we're going to create safety in the world, how we're going to live, our limitations on money, our limitations on health, our limitations on everything are guided by those boundaries of mom and dad because they gifted that to us in our conception story. But we have to make it our own, the individualization of it, the individuation process. So the word omphalos means the navel or the center or the hub of something. It is this stone here, and it is found in the Oracle at Delphi in Greece. The Oracle of Delphi, I've told you, is where all the prophecies happened. Everyone would go to the Oracle, and the Oracle would tell them the prophecy of Narcissus or the prophecy of Achilles and these myths that we've covered. So we all have a prophecy. We've talked about the gift of prophecy, the curse of prophecy as a Greek value, and we live by these prophecies of what we were told we had the capacity to be or not be. So we need to become sort of the center of our life. The only way that we can become the center, the navel, the omphalos is by knowing ourselves. In Delphi, there is a big sign that says, man, know thyself and you will know the wonders of the universe. The universe is within, it's the 12 archetypes, the 12 planets, the 12 disciples the 12 gods, however you want to look at it. So it said that Zeus sent two eagles. Eagles are the symbol of transformation and the shadow, rising out of the shadow, rising out of the impure thoughts and rising like the phoenix. The eagle is another symbol of that same message to find the center of the world. And it was said that the stone, the omphalos, was thrown at Delphi or dropped at Delphi. You are the center of your world your values, your shadow, your impure thoughts, owning them, transmuting them, nobody else. Yes, there's a boundary of what you can do within the limitation of the family that you chose in your low level consciousness. But within that archetype, you can get all the way to the heights of the archetype, the highest level of consciousness. Our belly button is our navel and we are birthed through there. Our mother gave us breath and gave us food and nourishment during that time into which we transitioned into the earth. That was it. We don't owe anything past that. We have to come and find our own path and be the center of our own life. It's very difficult. This is why people will not write down their values or define them clearly. Birth is considered holy and profane. There is a wonderful author by the name of Mircea Elias, Eliad, actually, it was wrong. Um, and he writes a lot about shamanism. He writes a lot about um, a lot of wonderful um, topics, very symbolic language. And he wrote something called the holy or the sacred and the profane, I think was the exact name of the, of the book. Um, 
and it's linked to, I've told you, birth process all of last month that we did um, forensics. I told you that the archetype of Pluto is all linked to transitions. And every single transition is an attempt to move into ourselves, move into our own birth, our rebirth process, and identify our value systems. He also said terra matter, which is another word for Mother Earth. Um, is loaded with symbolic language. All month, I talked about the body, the work, these earthly forms, what we think is doldrum, what we think is the earth element that limits us, boundaries, is all Mother Earth, is all symbolic, is the form that houses this divinity, that houses our um, the center of self, our fire, so that it can grow appropriately and not burn or not play small. And all religious experiences, and this is important, I don't like the word religious, but spiritual experiences, if you will, are connected with fecundity, birth, um, impregnation, um, and birth have cosmic structure. So all things that bring you back to this center, the belly button, the navel, you being the center of your world, you knowing yourself, are religious or in my language, spiritual experiences. It doesn't matter if it's about tipping. It doesn't matter about figuring out if you're gonna pick up your dog's poop. Every single thing is a spiritual experience when it brings you back to your individuation process, when it brings you back to your values, when it brings you back to your worth, how you're gonna manage your money, your time and resources, which are the language and the currency of the earthly world. So now I'd like to go into the 12 archetypes. You hear me every month, I kind of pick apart one archetype and I you know, drill it into you in every single which way. So because this is sort of the office and such a prime place for seeing all archetypes, I thought it was appropriate and just to sort of wrap up the month with the show, the office, so you can see them all. Every single thing. So when a client speaks those first words, Everything in the world is designated as one of the 12 archetypes. That's it. Those are our categories. It's not that hard. We just have to learn to live symbolically, understand. Obviously, that's why I share with you myth and symbol and numerology and the Enneagram and astrology so that you have a repertoire. When I teach shamanism, I add the animal totem to that. I add the astronomy if we see that no matter what the person sort of shares, it's linked to one of these archetypes, we can help them define those values related to that archetype, to that value system, to that part of their life. That's why I showed you the pillars. It doesn't matter how many you want to incorporate. I'm just saying everything breaks down to 12. So we're not that difficult. We just have to have sort of a repertoire of language and understanding so that we understand what words or what things they're sharing with us and what archetypes. When it tends to be about work, tends to be about the Saturn archetype that we've covered our month, sacred space, including the form, limitations, work ethics, values around work, boundaries, and of course, all people in the office, because all archetypes are found everywhere. In your family, you've got all 12. In your office, you've got all 12. We're going to kind of break those down and just see some some you know comedic effort at um, including the the twelve. So that's where the Vayera comes in. If you can hear the first words of the client story of the issue of the day, you'll be able to know. Oh, this is the archetype. This is where we have to hone in today. This is what they're working through in terms of their value system. So in the office, in general, any office, I'll tie it back to the TV show, you're going to find all 12 of these archetypes. Remember I said the 12 Olympian gods, the 12 archetypes, the 12 disciples. It's you in the Joseph story where the wheat bowed down to him, the brothers, the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to see this repeated over and over, the 12 astrology houses, the planets, etc. So you have an innocent archetype. This person tries to people please. But the shadow is that they might avoid responsibility by playing small or playing childlike. So this is the Neptune archetype. We're going to see this with, um, with Stanley in the, in the office. 
the every person. The every person is kind of like the commoner. It could be the wounded warrior. Um, it could be someone that that tries to patch up things. Um, he wants to be kind of like, there is a, a nice mask there as well. Um, they might be very empathic, but really what motivates them? The caregiver. The caregiver is the moon. The moon has to do with the mother. So there's a very passive aggressive codependent tendency. You're going to see that with Phyllis in the show. And they put the needs of others before their own, but we know what that means. We know that that isn't genuine. The hero archetype, we're going to see this with Jim. This is you in the sense of you're the hero of your story, what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey. So you're the son. It's all about you. Um, this is very, very important that we understand the archetype because there tends to be a narcissistic trend to this archetype because if it's all about us and we're the divine what we're trying to do is obviously um, manage um, our fire in one direction or another so we spend most of our time looking at the other archetypes to figure out how we want to show up in the world the lover is venus um usually and you'll see it with kelly in the show makeup um, instagram social butterfly at the low consciousness level remember this is just a joke in terms of the show at the low consciousness. We all have these archetypes and we have a right to raise the consciousness around them and live in them in the highest vibration. Um, a very big focus on um, relationships and wanting other people, of course, to like him or her, being heard and relationships and social um, interactions in the office is important. The explorer, this is always ready doesn't really get hung up um, onto the next thing, wants to figure it out. Um, at the low level consciousness, it could be vulgarity, it can be very in your face, it can be fired a lot because they're confrontational. And that's Black Moon that's always looking for kind of what's next. The creator archetype has to do with um, competition. The per person's always looking for the next sale, the next big thing, the next rung of the ladder. There's a big ambitious streak here and maybe we'll bulldoze um, those ahead of them to get ahead. Um, the revolutionary, you'll see this with Creed. They don't want to follow the rules. They always want to be original. Um, they want to, you know, beat to their own drum. Um, they get very caught up in ideals um, and that's with Uranus. The magician we talked about at length last month is Pluto, has to do with transitions. They also tend to be loners. Um, they're also, remember I told you it has to do with twos, the before and the after. These are people that might come back to the office and you'll see that in the show where he comes back to the office and he has two different roles. Um, they tend to have visionary, uh, visions. They're, they're very much a visionary, bigger plans and maybe what the outfit would allow for. Um, but they can also create at the low vibration, a lot of crisis and a lot of drama, and they're always in, in, in conflict. Um, Jupiter, Jupiter is the ruler archetype, someone who has big ideas, um, but it's usually for their own, uh, to meet their own needs. I mean, that's pretty general, but, um, but Jupiter archetype, remember, he was always cheating on Hera. He loved to party. Um, it could be the office, you know, partier, the one that's always kind of like the Venus archetype, the lover archetype, but it's always for maybe networking or seeing what they can get out of it. Um, the sage is Saturn at a high vibration. Um, usually the person that's the rule keeper, the one that has the structure that has to manage the office policies and procedures, very analytical. And the jester will be Michael who's the class clown or the office clown. Um, they might be very good communicators and negotiators because those are high archetypes of Mercury, um, but they might be that buffoon. They might be the one that, that can't ever know when the timing is right to make a joke versus you know reading the room and knowing that it's not appropriate. So this is the show, The Office, which is an absolute hit in both Britain and the US. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you just a little clip. They have a whole best of, I'm not going to show you the, the 10 or 12 minutes of each one, but 
I'm going to sh show you kind of like the low level consciousness, how they describe each of the archetypes um, in the show. And then I'll show you like a little video clip of each one. And basically, this is you. These are the archetypes that live in your head. These are the aspects of self that have maybe not been integrated. There are co collaborative voices, as I've shared with you, that you might have no problem with. You might really like, you know, the guy that's the bookkeeper or that's organized and structured because you might have a very integrated Saturn archetype or um, analytical side, but yet the court jester or the, the Michael of the team, you might find just a little distasteful and you don't like that aspect. That speaks to the part of you and your psyche that you need to integrate. So the workplace as a sacred environment allows us on a day in and day out basis to see these personalities, these personality traits, and always go back to that judgment. Judgments are confessions and they're great because they link you back to your value system. And then you can use those zero to 100 charts that I shared with you about virtues and vices. So we're going to start with the sun, and this is Jim. So Jim is pretty rational character, not emotional. He is kind of funny. Him and his girlfriend, Pam, sort of are like the center mom and dad, if you will, of the show and their love interest and their sort of fairy tale romance is sort of woven in, um, sometimes viewed as the dream guy. So think of the hero archetype very narcissistic. In one episode, he bought um, his girlfriend a house um, and this grand gesture. Um, so this is us. Like, how do we show up narcissistically or to meet our own needs? He didn't sort of buy a house and consider her. It was all about, about him. Um, oftentimes, our, our son archetype, ourselves, will have a savior complex because we're the divine, we're God. We should be able to... Um, to save everybody. And that's something that happens in our field, right? I've told you, if we were told that we were responsible for our mom and dad's emotions, how can we not be narcissistic? How can it not be around us? And this is definitely the sun, that glyph Apollo archetype, or that glyph that it's all about us, but we're trying to figure, um, figure that out. Um, he's somewhat of condescending at times to Michael. Um, so it's sort of that father archetype that's condescending, like I know best, because um, it's literally about him, but he's kind of like an overall down to earth, normal guy. So let me show you just a little bit. Everything egotistical, um, narcissistic sort of spark. Um, so these are just very little clips, um, but you can see the condescension. You can see that he has kind of like this, this know it all. Um, and then the humor, um, so this is sort of representative of us in the office, how we show up, we're the center of, of everything and everything that happens in our workspace directly relates back to us. So you may not know you're the know-it-all in the office, but your psyche thinks it is. So the moon archetype is Phyllis Vance. Um, she's married or at some point she's dating and then marries um, Bob, Bob Vance. She's very open about her wholesome sex life that's healthy. She's overweight. There's a lot of weight jokes. There's a lot of things about, um, about food as well. She makes fudge. So this is very mu much that mother archetype, that moon archetype. The thing is that she's very under her breath, very passive aggressive. So it's not the overt black moon Lilith that we'll see that's very sexual and promiscuous, but this is someone who like puts on that sort of motherly smile, but jabs you, you know, with that sort of like under the knee, uh, underneath the breath, sort of passive aggressive codependent uh, tries to nurture you. The food has to do with, um, or the overweight has to do with that archetype that I'm like the boob, I'm like the eternal nurturer or motherer. Some motherly, but then in her, you know, she says, I don't like you. And then she makes some sort of sexual innuendo. So it's a very passive aggressive sort of codependent, you know, snarky below the breath because the image is that sort of moon archetype of I'm so wholesome and motherly. Next is the Mercury archetype. So Michael's like the star of the show and he's a total buffoon. Um, 
the Mercury archetype is the child, the eternal child. In the myth of Mercury, I told you that he steals Apollo's cows and then he goes up to Zeus and just bats his little eyelashes and he's given the messenger of the gods. This is a company where they sell paper. Um, so sales is obviously part of the Mercury archetype, but people that may be good communicators or like I said, they're comedians, but they don't know when to turn it off. They're sort of um, gestures. They're also liars, cheats, steals at a very low vibration. So Michael will lie to sort of cover it up. Um, he wants to be liked by everybody. Again, that sort of buffoonery this nonsensical sort of silly character. What's funny about that particular thing with the foot is that Mercury actually rules the extremities. So when you start to learn to live symbolically and listen symbolically, that Viera concept, if someone talks about their foot, even though Neptune um, rules feet per se, the extremities of movement, I cannot move, I need to be uh, picked up to take to work, is actually a Mercury um, a Mercury archetype. The next is Mars. This is Andy Bernard. He's sent to Ant anger management. So Mars is, you know, the god of war, of anger, um, and passion. Um, passion's another another word for for this archetype. Um, so he, you see, he's very passionate, and um, you know, with when he talks about women and things like that, but. He also mocks Michael a lot. So there's this like, what can I do to kiss up? Um, but it's really with the intention of getting ahead. Um, he's very pretentious. He doesn't care who he steamrolls um, to get ahead. Um, and he went to Cornell. So Mars is that ambitious sort of, I'm going, you know, it's the glyph of, of, um, of the circle with the arrow. So it's like directed energy, I'm going where I have to where I have to go. Or overt power, like um, the steamrolling or, you know, this talking about, you know, beer and going out and having fun. Um, but the shadow side of a Mars act archetype, when I tell you the truth is in the triangle that Hephaestus Mars were the two children of Zeus and Hera. So you see, he's like, oh, I annoyed you with my friendship, like taking offense and playing victim. So this is sort of like a shadow side of someone that that tries, you know, to be ambitious and when when they sort of fail or they're or they're turned down, the covert power um will show up. So Kelly Kapoor is the Venus archetype. <laughs> um she's about makeup and looking beautiful and falling in love and everything's about relationships and um she's in love with this guy named Ryan. Um, and all she does is try to, you know, dress up to impress. She's very much about pop culture and social media. She like coins herself the business bitch and the diet bitch and the shopping bitch and everything is just like, you know, being um, in fashion. And a lot of it cracks me up. Um, so that sort of ditzy stupid, of course, these are just, you know, low level consciousness representations, but that person that's like pink and pretty and, and just cares about makeup and hair and nails and things like that. That sort of femme girl of the office. Jupiter. So the Jupiter archetype is Jan. She is Michael's boss. Um, she starts a seminar um, to help women be leaders. Jupiter is very much um, oftentimes the, the leader archetype because it's God of Olympus but she's a big drinker, um, she's very sexual, she has a therapist, she shows the sex scenes to the therapist, she's crazy like Jupiter, just hopping around from anywhere. Um, at one point she loses her job and she buys all these things that she can't afford. Um, she renovates, she gets a new car. So there's a lot of like gluttony here. There's a lot of like escapism in the, in the sex and the, in the alcohol. Gluttonous sort of, you know, um, free living life as, as Jupiter was. Saturn is Dwight. So Dwight is all about policies, procedures. He's never missed a day of work. He, there's a joke that he never wastes time. So these are like archetypal words 
for, for Saturn, timeliness and boundaries and limitations and policies. Um, he doesn't have much in terms of social cues. I find funny that he they have him living on a farm, a beet farm, and beet have roots, and Saturn is about roots and sort of like, you know, the roots and, and being in the form. Um, also the farm where Saturn in, in mythology was the god of agriculture for, for 30 years until he was dethroned. So you start seeing the archetype words and the archetype themes woven into characters. And that's how we live too. We unknowingly are living these archetypes pretty specifically. So at one point he even wrote a script about depression and Saturn rules depression. Um, the one that wants to keep um, everything in order. And even though he crashed, he kept going to, to, to do his duty. The word of Saturn is, is duty. Uranus. Uranus is Creed Breton. Um, he's like the hippie um, of the office. He's older. He talks about like, you know, when he, when he was in the 60s and being promiscuous and he like at one point in one scene um, collected money. He created this lie, collected this money. She got fired. He took the money from the card, even though he faked it. So it's that sort of like, I'm um, just a free spirit. I do whatever I want. No consequences, rebellion type of. And is always up to like some shenanigans. He's always making mess, messy mistakes. And he's funny and a trickster too. Um, but it's more about that whole carefree, rebellious spirit. I do what I want. So Neptune, the Neptune archetype is, is partly innocent, um, partly someone who is not social. If we go back to the myth of Neptune, he lives at the bottom of the, of the ocean. He doesn't really like to come out. Um, there's a passive aggressiveness, a codependence. Um, basically he does what he does, right? He rules the oceans, but, um, but there is a snarkiness, low, um, passive aggressive sort of nature. And that you'll see something related to the sort of water archetypes, like the moon with Phyllis and, um, and with Stanley. And he doesn't respect Michael. Um, the, it's sort of that Hephaestus, um, Mars brother, where one is very passive aggressive, but then something can bring out the anger, like in the scene where Andy was being all coy and then he became passive aggressive. So you see this sort of covert overt power um, with these sorts of archetypes and Stanley tends to be more um, covert power and he just sort of works. But you see that victim, I hate my job, my daughter's school's too expensive. So you see this sort of victimization of his, of his life. Next is Pluto, um, which is Ryan. He went to jail for fraud. And we talked about last month, the criminal. Um, so definitely the criminal archetype that he has. Um, he's very manipulative. He's very much a snake. That's very typical Pluto at the low level consciousness. Um, he applied for this corporate job and he didn't tell anybody again, the sneaky behind the scenes. Um, he brags a lot. So again, that sort of, you know, plutocracy of like power and wealth. Um, he actually lives out a Pluto archetype in the sense that he leaves the company and then he comes back. So he lives that, that, um, that Pluto archetype of, of coming and going of, of twice. Remember I said the beat the before and after. But um, his character, I think we see it when he like hooked up with Kelly and he's like, oh my God. And it's a day before Valentine's like, how am I going to get out of this? That sort of manipulation and snake sort of, of thought. So Chiron archetype um, has a lot of layers. It's sort of that wounded um, healer archetype, but it's also the Virgin Mary or that, you know, I'm such a, a good girl. So Angela um, plays um, plays this character. She, you know, they show her as a decent mother. Animals, Chiron archetype tends to have animals. Um, she's in charge of safety. So again, that wounded warrior, I heal your wounds type of thing. Um, she's all about her image. 
watching her figure at one point they had like this contest to lose weight and she's like I don't need to lose weight I have to gain weight like um so it's all about this like perfection and pristine it's it's very um very purifying and, and virginal but yet there's this whole underlying judgment of anybody that wears a skirt that might be too short um or knowing um what people are sort of doing in the office that isn't you know pure um yet she is notorious for having you know premarital sex even though she judges it or or sleeping around and, and having affairs so she's definitely the goody <laughs> she's just so full of judgment and yet like behind the scenes is doing everything she does is just like us right our zero to 100 um and then the last archetype is the black moon which is meredith so Meredith is very confrontational. She's very vulgar. She calls people out on their crap. Um, they show her as like white trash, sex with everyone, walk of shame, very blunt, very vulgar, doesn't care. Just, you know, a typical black moon, low level consciousness. Meredith. So this is sort of like a comical way of showing the archetypes, but in our offices and in our heads and in our lives and our families, we have all of these archetypes and they're there to identify the aspects of self that we don't like so that we can become integrated and whole. So your words are linked to your values. Your values are linked to your archetypes and integrating your archetypes is the key to making you whole. So here are all of the archetypes with you as the hero, as Jim or, or, or the sun in the center. If any of these descriptors for you or your clients or words or low level consciousness, because this is obviously the point of the show is just to make it so sort of low level, affects you or bothers you or rubs you the wrong way or when you're watching TV or interacting with people, you identify that that archetype is one that you need to work. If you link it back to the vices, to the virtues, to your judgments, you're gonna start seeing this threaded in your life. It might be an area that you're blatantly obvious about, but nobody tells you about, or people have criticized you, or even on, on self-appraisal or an appraisal at work has come up and you're kind of like appalled that that would be something that someone would describe you as. So remember, a lot of these shadow aspects, because they're shadow, they're hidden or we hide them in those zero to 100 because we don't wanna be like our parents. And you can see which aspects are linked to the bad buckets, are linked to those shadow aspects of parents, are linked to values that mom and dad said, no, that's not the way we are in this house. So for instance, Angela's character, if you were like meet other people's needs or being in charge of safety or be very pure and, and judgmental, or judgmental about what was risque behavior could be that you're just hiding your black moon Lilith archetype, which is more open and promiscuous. And then lastly, I love Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell is probably the most famous mythologist. Um, and he said, if you really want to help this world, what you will have to teach is how to live in it. So he was a teacher at Sarah Lawrence College, I think for 30 years. And he studied all the myths and, and he found, you know, the threads of the hero's journey in it. And he um, identified that the way to actually help is to teach people how to live in the world. We are not taught that. We're, we're, we're given threads, we're given fragments of this. Our parents, like I said, give us our consciousness, our values, our thoughts. But really part of our role as a therapist is to help someone to live in the world, to live safely, to live with the value system, to live with the philosophy of life, of rule book. Those are my words, but what I use in practice. And so some of the sort of takeaways that I try to, um, to live by and then um, in turn give to clients is to teach people how to live with their values. When you have a clear value system, you will not self-betray. Um, you can live safely in the world. Teach people to embrace all aspects of themselves, even the sad, shadow side, especially the shadow side. So all of those archetypes that perhaps are competitive voices that you don't like about yourself or that you judge in others, teaching your clients 
that those impure thoughts that are linked to those judgments are simply aspects of themselves that need discovery. Teach people that they're every person. All of us are commoners. All of us are everybody else. In the universe, there is no other. So anything obviously that you don't like or you like about someone, there's something you really admire about someone that you have that in you and the capacity to be that as well. Teach people that they are original and ordinary. Yes, you definitely have an original, you know, creed archetype in you, but you're also ordinary like everybody. Teach people to listen. Um, we oftentimes don't listen and we're on the defensive and um, we're linked to the judgment. And then we go into trying to, to process that thought as a judgment or feeling guilty about it. But rather, if we learn to listen to what other people say, the universe is speaking through them and plus they're showing aspects of ourselves that we want to integrate. Teach people how to use their money, time, and resources wisely. This is a big part of education that children don't learn. I was teaching a shaman class this weekend and I was talking about the energy. We unknowingly or knowingly leave our energy in people's space and people will leave their energy in your space. It's important that everybody collect up their own energy and take it with them. If you're trying to leave your energy in someone's space, it's kind of like the typical girlfriend leaves her sweater at the boy's dorm. You leave energy in another person's space or vice versa. They're kind of manipulating you or there's a, it's a form of coercion because there isn't a strict boundary. So learning to use our resources or our time and saying no and having the valor and the courage to end on time or, or to say no, like I said the other day, be a no-sayer is really a helpful tool for living. Teach people to make themselves a priority. You're ultimately the sun, the navel of your solar system, of your life. It's all about you. Then and only then can you give and serve to another. Teach people how to have structure and limits. In this uh, day and age of independence, originality, individuation, we think that it's about creating chaos and not having any structure or limits when actually that's the safest and the healthiest way to really be original and shine. And teach people how to have a personal rule book and a philosophy of life that's rooted in their definition of health, in their value system, linked to themselves and what they value. So these are sort of the takeaways um, that I've learned through life, not having the safety, working in the world of symbol and archetypes and myth um, that I try to give clients to help them live better in the world. So I'm gonna stop the recording and take attendance.